I made this gigantic warehouse diorama almost three years ago. And today I'm shooting to make a version that's 1095% better than last time. You might be thinking to yourself, that's a really random number, but it's actually not. I try to get 1% better on each project and I'm hoping that I can prove to you that I've done that over the last three years. I don't typically recreate dioramas, but this one is going to be pretty easy because the dimensions are simple. So I got one of these project foam boards at Home Depot of XPS foam that's 24 inches by 24 inches and this is one inch foam which is exactly the dimensions of the base of this one. This is also a 20 inch high wall, so it's gonna be, again, 24 inch pieces, but they're gonna be 20 inches high. So I'll have two on the sides, one in the middle, just like you see here. I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that I have these walls as a template, and before I magnetize the base, I'm gonna mark out where the garage door and the front door are located so that I know that I can't put magnets in those areas, especially for the garage door, because the garage door is actually removable. So if I were to try to put magnets here, I would have a big problem. So all I'm gonna do is take my X-Acto knife, make sure this is lined up. Just put two little marks there, and then the same thing on the door frame. Just like that. Now that I know where those doors are gonna be, I can actually magnetize the diorama. And I do that by using the first piece as a guide. I chose to place the magnets in the exact same spot as the original just to make things easier on myself. Once I knew where those needed to be, I took the opportunity to take my copper tubing and increase the indent of those places. All you need to do here is a simple twisting motion. And just like that, all of my magnet areas are mapped out. Now I just need to cut them out. I covered this in my magnetization video, but in case you haven't seen that, all I do here is take the magnet, outline where I want it to be, and then use my X-Acto knife to evenly cut a level line and then pop out the little circular piece of pink foam. Here they all are. And here's a shot of where they were. Next up, I use my low temperature hot glue gun to glue these magnets in place, and I'm very careful about the polarity of those magnets. For more on that, watch my magnetization video. If you've never done this before, it's really important to make sure that you use a glue gun that's on a low temperature setting. The high temperature setting will often melt the foam, which you absolutely do not want. You also want to make sure you put enough hot glue in each one of these holes to keep the magnets in place over time. Then I take the other magnets that are going to connect in the walls and I place them on top of the base magnets. I need to cut the height of the walls which is going to be 20 inches tall which I do with my Proxon. So now this diorama is fully magnetized to mirror the layout of the original and honestly this one's going to be much better off because I use higher quality magnets now than I used to when I made this diorama. So ultimately, this is gonna be a sturdier, longer lasting piece. I don't always do things in the same order on every project, and this time, for some reason, I elected that I wanted to carve, texture, and paint the base before doing anything with the walls on the dial. For this process, I'm using an X-Acto knife, a T-square, and a bigger drywall T-square that actually spans the two-foot area that I'm working on. It's really important to concentrate at this point. I don't want the X-Acto knife to slip and mess up my sidewalk separation areas. And I also use a very sharp knife to ensure that as well. Then I turn to my trusty ball of aluminum foil, which I almost always use to texture concrete surfaces. I'm not sure if you guys can notice this, but there's a little crack right here in the pink foam that I kind of want to accentuate because the client, Modern Toy Fair, really liked the crack work in the recent cracked concrete diorama tutorial that I did. For this kind of thing, I use a rock that I found in my backyard and I just press it into the foam and let the force of the pushing actually create some more natural looking cracks. So as you can see, I've been using my reference piece to develop my modern Toy Fair piece. And something that's really important that I want to talk about here is how I am trying to improve upon the original. I'm not trying to do an exact replica. 
I want the piece to reflect the improvement I've had over the last three years. So I'm going to do that with a couple of different measures and one of those is going to be the way that I treat the concrete. I'm going to use lightweight wall spackle to make the concrete floor look more realistic on the new version than it did on the old version. To do this I take an old gift card and I take a little bit of the lightweight wall spackle on the gift card and I apply it to the piece trying to apply it in thin layers. Doing this is really going to enhance the piece and it's going to make my job a lot easier in trying to get believability from my paint job. And I do my best to get a pretty even distribution of this stuff on the dial. It doesn't have to be perfect but this looks pretty good to me. Another thing that I do is I allow the wall spackle to get into the magnet crevices to help them be more stable overall. Something that I almost always do on commission builds is add in this little Vasco Toys 3D printed PLA plate to my dioramas just so anyone that's looking at them is reminded that it was created by Vasco Toys. I almost always use hot wire foam factory styro goo to attach my PLA printed parts to my foam pieces. Okay, so now this is dry enough, the wall spackle was dry enough that I can actually paint this. But one other thing I just wanted to point out is the difference in how I'm going to paint this versus the original. This was base coated and then all dry brushed. And I think when you guys see how I do this differently, there's going to be a big difference. So I'm going to base coat this, then I'm going to do washes, then I might dry brush and I might airbrush. When I was making this, I definitely wasn't doing a lot of washes and I definitely had never even opened my airbrush yet. So we're going to go ahead and base coat this with a light gray, a granite gray by Apple Barrel. I try to apply a little bit to each concrete slab. From there it's just a matter of getting a complete base coat that covers the entire piece with this acrylic paint. And now it's time to use a little dropper bottle to apply my black wash to this piece in a way that's going to make it look like realistic concrete. The key to this is to apply some of the black wash and then take a paper towel and just start blotting it all over the piece. This step is really going to bring out the texture that we established with the lightweight wall spackle earlier in the process. And just to be sure you get an opportunity, here's a comparison shot so you can see this versus the original. Now that I'm done with the base, it's time to start adding some detail to the wall. And that starts with the garage door. I used one of the raw prints, this is actually pretty much a failed print that I didn't end up using as the final piece, to map out where the garage door needs to be on the piece based on the markings that I made early on in the video. Okay, so this isn't exactly the size I want it to be. It's actually an inch shorter than I want it to be, but that's okay. I can figure out how to account for that, which I was able to do in my recent garage door build video that you can watch now on my channel. But at the time I was filming this, the best I could do is take the garage door made out of foam from the original project and use that as my reference point. At this point I'm really just creating markings to make sure I know where everything goes, which is what I'm doing here for the windows using my X-Acto knife and my T-square. I do that same exact thing on the other two walls, the one with the garage which I previously carved the garage area on. And the third wall. Here you can see all of the windows are outlined. None of them have actually been carved out yet, but I have an idea of where to cut. When I actually cut out the windows, I use a brand new box cutter and I make sure I do multiple passes to try and avoid fraying the foam, which is something that's very easy to do if you're using a dull knife or if you go too quickly. Then I'm able to use a sawing motion to actually cut the windows out as cleanly as possible. And I would caution you to take your time here. I always get really excited at different points in diorama making and I kind of want to rush through things, but it really doesn't pay off at all to do that. So just take your time and let the process happen. Next up, I do the same exact thing on my piece that's going to require the most cutting, which is the piece that includes that garage door I showed you earlier on. It's always a good idea to make sure that you shift the piece so that you can cut it as easily as possible. So for me with the sawing motion, that meant standing them up like this. 
Because I 3D printed the door and garage door, they're going to be incredibly precise in terms of the angles, and I want to be able to insert them reliably into the foam so that they fit almost in a friction fit. So I decided to use my Proxon because there's no cleaner cut in foam than this kind of cutter. I did have to cut the top portion of the garage by hand though because my Proxon wouldn't reach in there cleanly so I really tried to just focus on this and make sure that I had a straight up and down cut and went slowly through the entire portion of this. And then in a similar way to what I did with the magnetization I used the 3D print of the double door to make an indent in the foam to show me where I'm going to need to cut this with the Proxon. I want the door to feel as though it is inside the wall, not sitting on top of it, which is why I'm doing it this way. I absolutely love the Proxon, but I do have a gripe with it. It doesn't have adjustable height on the cutting portion of the tool, which I think really limits it. But there's always a workaround, so what I decided to do is cut this piece in half and then cut it down in the indent spot that I made in the previous frame. With those pieces cut, I decided to do a dry run. I put these in, first both foam pieces, then I take my two 3D printed parts of the door, which is the frame, and then the door itself, just to make sure that this is lining up the way that I want it to. And for good measure, let's go ahead and pop these little 3D printed door handles on, just for fun. I'm going to glue those foam components in here permanently, but before I do that, I want to take the opportunity to texture the corners of the edge of the doorway. And then once again, using my hot glue gun, I go ahead and glue in these piece by piece. I make sure I know which is supposed to be the top because I did hand cut the top portion of this and which is supposed to be the bottom so it fits in there nice and snug as designed. I'm getting close to base coating this, but I realized that I overshot some of my cuts on the windows and I don't want those to be visible on the final product. So I used the wall spackle to fill them in before base coating. When I originally painted the first diorama that we're recreating, I used Cafe Olay by Anita's as the base color for the walls, but I am almost completely out of this and I definitely don't have enough to paint this diorama. So I'm going to use a paint color sample that you would use. This is like house paint, Sherwin-Williams, that you would use on your, on your house, like walls in your house. And I've had this for several years just sitting on the shelf. It's very close to that color. So I'm going to use this instead. I started out base coating this just with a paintbrush the way I did on the base of the diorama, but I kind of realized that it was just going to kind of take forever to paint this. I wanted to paint both sides of it, and I wanted to paint all three walls, so I decided to do something a little bit different. I've never done this myself before, but I've seen other diorama artists use a paint roller on this kind of diorama, and since I'm actually using paint that you would use on the walls of a house with a paint roller, I figured I'll give it a shot. I'm definitely glad I did this, especially on the second coat where I was really able to eliminate all the pink that was coming through from the background. But I will say I kind of wish that I had a smaller roller because this one was a little bit unwieldy for me, as you can tell by it moving around all over the place as I paint this. But overall, it was definitely a time efficiency save for me, and I really couldn't argue with the results of how these looked base coated. Thank you so much for watching part one of my diorama build series of my commission for Modern Toy Fair. In part two, we're going to step into some of the more detail oriented work, like installing windows, doors, airbrushing, and other details. I hope you'll stick around and see how this one finishes out. Vasco Toys, action figure dioramas and props.